Okay, welcome to the third AgriSolar Clearinghouse webinar, everyone. If you need any technical assistance or you'd like to contact us, please email us at agrisolar at ncat.org. Uh, we've got a great turnout today. So everyone, your videos are muted just to reserve bandwidth, unless if you're a presenter, uh, but you can drop questions into the chat. We'll answer as many as we can along the way. And then there should be a good 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A period. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from our partners in the AgriSolar Clearinghouse from Argonne National Laboratory. We're going to be hearing from Lee Walston and from Heidi Hartman. Lee is an ecologist at the Argonne National Laboratory, where he is the head of ecology, natural resources, and a managed systems department within the Environmental Services Division. He has over a decade of experience in efforts to better understand and minimize the ecological impacts of solar energy. For the past five years, he's supported DOE funded projects to evaluate the ecological and ecosystem services opportunities of solar pollinator habitat. He also served on several renewable energy advisory boards and working groups, such as the Renewable Energy Working Group and the Wildlife Society. Heidi Hartman manages the Land Resources and Energy Policy Program within the Environmental Sciences Division at Argonne National Laboratory. Heidi's career has been focused on the assessment of impacts of environmental stressors on human health and ecosystems, with an emphasis on stressors introduced by various types of energy use. Most recently, she has supported the Bureau of Land Management and Department of Energy projects assessing environmental impacts and potential ecosystem services impacts from utility scale solar development. Lee and Heidi, welcome. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, great to be here and good afternoon or good morning to everyone. Um, thank you all for joining today as we talk about the ecosystem services of solar pollinator habitat. This is an area that I and my colleague Heidi Hartman, who is here today with us, uh, have been working on for several years to examine and, and, and study the feasibility and the potential uh, benefits that we uh, could try to quantify and see at, at solar sites. Um, we've got quite a few slides to share with you today, um, but here is the general outline, if you will, of what we wanna cover. Uh, just a little bit about our, the projects that we work on, um, and then introduce some of the theoretical concepts of solar pollinator habitat and the ecosystem services of, of solar pollinator habitat. Uh, and then moving into our current work that has tried to move the needle a little bit in, in terms of going from theoretical understanding to uh, empirical uh, data-driven understanding of uh, solar pollinator habitat ecosystem services. Uh, and then finally, we'll we'll finish things off in today's slide uh, uh, slideshow on on future work, some of the future things that we are doing at Argonne to uh, understand ecosystem service benefits and opportunities at solar energy facilities. Um, so, without any further ado, uh, to begin, I just want to mention the two main projects that uh, you know we've been uh, 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 working on for most of our work. Most of you might be aware of these two projects both of which are funded by DOE's uh, Solar Energy Technologies Office. Uh, the first one is INSPIRE, stands for Innovative Solar Practices Integrated with Rural Economies and Ecosystems. We'll just call it INSPIRE. <laughs> um, it started in 2017 and is currently, it's led by INREL. It is the nation's largest and most comprehensive agrivoltaics research project. Uh, INSPIRE has many research partners and project sites um, you know, I, the, the little dots that I have here on this map, they only represent the sites where Argonne has been involved in either Inspire or the second project that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but through both of these two projects, the, the, the map of project sites is much larger than the little map that I have here on the left. Just, just note that these little icons indicate the projects where Argonne has been working on through these, through these two projects. Um, so yeah, like I said, the list of pro uh, project partners um, is quite extensive for Inspire. Um, again, it's focused on uh, agrivoltaics. The second project called Phase, it stands for Pollinator Habitat Aligned with Solar Energy. Um, again, it's it's uh, 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 being performed for the Department of Energy's Solar Energy Technology Office. Again, uh, the lead uh, in uh, institution here is uh, the University of Illinois uh, at Chicago. 
Um, and so while Inspire broadly covers sort of all agrivoltaic designs, the second project phase, uh, it's focused solely on solar pollinator habitat. Um, and so uh, it's, it's looking at various more specific questions related to the energy and the economic uh, outputs of solar sites uh, with solar pollinator habitat, some of the ecological uh, uh, performance uh, uh, metrics with solar pollinator habitat and how these, uh, you know, how these sites might be influenced by, by scale and different kinds of pollinator plantings. Um, and so this slide shows a little bit more details, uh, detail on the, the, the partners, the research partners uh, for either one of these two projects. There's some overlap um, in, between these two projects in terms of research partners. I also want to mention that both projects have advisory groups. Um, this is sort of the advisory group for the Inspire project, as you can see many different uh, 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 organizations participating in the advisory group, ranging from uh, NGOs and environmental firms all the way through solar facilities or solar companies, I should say, research companies um, and, and governments. Just lots of lots of different organizations participating in, this, in these advisory groups. FaZe also has an advisory group. You in the audience might actually be a participant on either a as a research partner or as uh, an advisory group member for either one or maybe both of these projects. So. That's just a little background on, on the, the projects where most of what we are going to share today uh, comes from. Uh, so as we begin, I just want to real quick talk about the types of agrivoltaic designs um, and their ecosystem service opportunities. So ecosystem services, what are they? They are the direct and indirect benefits that ecosystems can provide to humans. Um, this is straight from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, that was done, oh, well, now going on almost two decades ago. Um, they consist of several types of ecosystem services, provisioning services, such as food production, regulating services, such as carbon sequestration, water, soil conservation, et cetera, supporting services, such as photosynthesis, um, and then cultural services, which we might think of as being recreation or things like that. Um, and, uh, and so looking at these, we can understand quite a few, or at least envision you know, the types of ecosystem services that could uh, be realized through different agrivoltaic designs. Um, and here we, we are considering uh, agrivoltaics to include solar energy dual use uh, projects uh, that can benefit agricultural production, including solar pollinator habitat, which could have uh, a number of different ecosystem services, which I'll, I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, but but we, we use this graphic to sort of conceptually illustrate uh, the types of agrivoltaic designs and at a very high level, the types of ecosystem services uh, agrivoltaics can, can provide. Thinking more specifically about solar pollinator habitat, well, we do have a working definition of what Argon considers to be solar pollinator habitat the establishment of regionally native grasses and forbs within the solar site's footprint uh, that can attract and support insect pollinators by providing nesting and foraging areas. Um, and so thinking about that native habitat, that native vegetation compared to alternative land uses, such as uh, maybe what that site might have been before solar development, in many cases in the Midwest, that's row crop agriculture, or uh, comparing to another type of conventional solar vegetation land use, such as turf grass. Um, you know, thinking about those different types of scenarios, you know, you can think of eco, uh, various different types of ecosystem services related to solar pollinator habitat that this graphic tries to conceptually illustrate again, uh, sort of comparing native, native habitat at solar sites with turf grass. Um, you can think of uh, better, uh, you know, biodiversity conservation, which we've got a slide that talks about, you know, sort of the benefits of biodiversity coming up. Um, better stormwater and erosion control, better soil quality and quantity, uh, carbon storage potential. Uh, solar pollinator habitat has the potential to improve the site's uh, carbon storage potential, um, as well as improving agricultural services in terms of pollination and pest control to offsite areas. Um, fortunately, uh, the idea of solar pollinator habitat isn't completely new. Um, we can look at previous studies that have done uh, grassland native prairie restoration in agricultural environments to kind of get an idea of what has been done before and what kinds of uh, benefits could we expect, what kinds of ecosystem services could we expect if uh, you know, uh, the restoration of native grasses and forbs occurs at solar sites in a way that's similar to 
uh, native grassland restoration in other types of agricultural environments. Uh, we use agricultural environments because uh, where we typically uh, do most of our work at Argonne National Laboratory, it's in the Midwest. Uh, most of the solar sites in the Midwest are sited on former row crop agricultural fields, so former uh, corn and soybean fields. Um, and so that's it's kind of the, 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 the scenario that we're comparing a lot of our uh, solar ecosystem service work against. Uh, but like you can see here, there's, you know, Reading across the bottom of this slide here, there are several studies, many more that, than are listed here, on different types of ecosystem service parameters associated with uh, native grassland restoration in agricultural settings. And, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. And so at Argonne, one of the things that we've done recently is we've taken some of those parameters and, and, and done some landscape modeling at solar sites in the Midwest to model what might be the theoretical or the, the hypothetical uh, ecosystem service benefits at solar sites uh, associated with solar pollinator habitat. And what we found, well, what, well first of all, what we did <laughs> is we, we took various solar sites across the Midwest and, and did some, uh, some uh, landscape uh, scenario planning where we had uh, uh, modeled uh, the Midwest assuming that all solar sites were uh, turf grass, or, or row crop agriculture, the previous you know solar land use, or and the third the third scenario was uh, solar pollinator habitat. Um, and so using these three scenarios and plugging in some of the parameters that I showed on the previous slide, uh, we conducted some modeling and found that um, you know there are some serious or or significant uh, uh, ecosystem service trade offs associated with these three different types of land uses at solar sites. And shown here in orange, which is the solar pollinator habitat scenario, could greatly uh, increase uh, habitat for, for pollinators. So uh, habitat quality for, for biodiversity uh, increases. Uh, carbon storage potential for the site also increases compared to the other land uses. Uh, sediment export or uh, runoff potential, I guess you can say, is lower among the site, which is better um, uh, for solar pollinator habitat sites. Uh, and then water retention, the ability to conserve and retain water at these sites is also uh, higher at, at these sites with, with solar pollinator habitat. So this kind of theoretical hypothetical modeling uh, we, we did uh, in, in a recent uh, paper, um, again, to kind of examine the, the, the potential benefits. Um, I do have some slides that kind of translate us or, or walk us through some of the uh, more boots on the ground, field-based uh, 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 research that we've been doing. But before we get there, I just want to briefly mention, uh, since most of our work now focuses on biodiversity responses of, of solar energy development, I want to spend a moment to briefly uh, talk about the ecosystem services of biodiversity, why it's important, right? I think all of us probably know, you know, or have some ideas of uh, why biodiversity is important, but just want to briefly talk about on this on this slide. Uh, healthy ecosystems with higher biodiversity have been linked to a number of ecosystem services, including many of the ones listed here. Um, you know, and and more. Uh, the the list can go on and on. But things like well, not only food production that by itself, but also agricultural services in terms of pollination and pest control. Uh, better carbon storage, uh, 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 recreation, and climate change resilience, just to name a few, uh, have been associated with uh, uh, you know, improved biodiversity. Uh, where there's a direct correlation between biodiversity and these types of ecosystem services. A few, slide, uh, a few articles that sort of convey that point. Um, but now, without any uh, further ado, uh, I want to sort of translate or, or kind of migrate from the theoretical aspects of our work uh, to more of the applied or, or empirical aspects of our work um, and sort of moving the needle on, on what we know about solar pollinator habitat and its ecosystem services. The overarching research questions that we have that, that kind of guide our work are, are listed here. It includes, uh, you know, how long does it take? We often hear that from a lot of uh, partners um, and that's, you know, well, how long does it take for habitat to establish at these sites? Or how long does it take before we see biodiversity benefits? We, which seed mixes perform the best? Uh, what kinds of vegetation methods are most effective? Uh, such as, you know, what's free, you know, how does the frequency of mowing come into play? Or can we still use herbicides? Or how compatible is, is this with livestock grazing? Um, those kinds of questions. Um, and then finally, you know, are there differences across different scales of solar development and different configurations of pollinator habitat planting? Those are a lot of questions, right? Those are big questions. 
we're not able to answer all of them yet. Um, but I think with the research that we have uh, to share today, we can start to scratch the surface on, on some of these questions. Um, and so uh, I do have a couple of examples of our research to share. One comes from our, our work in Minnesota for the INSPIRE project, uh, looking at the insect pollinator responses of solar pollinator habitat in Minnesota. Um, this is work that we've done for the past five years from 2018 to 2022 with uh, these, these guiding research questions, you know, does pollinator abundance and diversity increase with the establishment of solar pollinator habitat? Does pollinator visitation uh, increase uh, or is it associated uh, uh, with, with the establishment of solar pollinator habitat on site? Do we see a relationship uh, with off-site visitation to agricultural fields? So measuring uh, pollinator visitation in nearby agricultural fields as well. Um, and so this is work that we started in 2018. These solar sites, the two solar sites that um, I'm showing here, um, they were created in 2017 and planted in early 2018, right before we started working on this project. So we have a year zero um, in this data set and year zero represents the year at which, you know, the, the, uh, the, the habitat was planted. Uh, our methods here include the Streamline B monitoring protocol. It's a transect-based protocol where we're going up and down uh, various transects at about five-minute intervals and just visually counting the number and the types of pollinators we see. This is a streamlined protocol, so there's no collection involved. Um, and we're only really interested in um, classifying pollinators to these higher level taxonomic groups, which I'll show in a minute. Um, but through this design, um, we're able to quantify the, the following um, habitat and biodiversity metrics. Uh, floral abundance, so a qualitative measure of the number of open flowers at each transect for each year from 2018 to 22. Uh, the flowering species richness, pollinator taxonomic group diversity, total pollinator abundance, native bee abundance, and then finally pollinator visitation to those offsite ag fields. So again, we're setting up transects in those offsite ag fields to see if there's a relationship with proximity to solar pollinator habitat. Uh, so I'm kind of fast forwarding a little bit. So here's a summary slide that presents a very high level snapshot of our of summary of that work. Um, and then we'll dive into a couple of details here in a minute. But real quick, uh, over the last five years, we, we surveyed over 650 on-site transects, made over 13,000 uh, 13, uh, identifications to some of these insect pollinator groups. These are the eight groups that you can see here. This is These are the groups that we wanted to identify every single observation to. In many cases, we were able to identify our observations to a more specific level, but at a minimum, these were the groups that we wanted to, to target. So honeybees, native bees, et cetera. Um, by far, the most numerous groups that we encountered were beetles, uh, uh, soldier, uh, soldier beetles, surfed flies, and moths. Um, and uh, the, the results that I'm about to share with you on the following slides, we are currently trying to um, you know, uh, work into a journal manuscript for, for publication. Um, in addition to those transect-based observations, we also set up uh, passive acoustic and camera tripods uh, on, on the solar sites and also in some of these offsite areas to, again, try to quantify some of the other biodiversity aspects in terms of wildlife activity at these sites. We have a couple slides that, that document that as well. Um, so here's another slide that shows where the transects were set up on site. The little bird icons show where the tripods were set up. Um, and this also shows an, an adjacent ag field about one kilometer away where we set up some transects on roadsides. So we have some roadside transects and also some uh, 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 transects that were adjacent to CRP fields. Um, okay, here's what we found real quick in a nutshell. Yeah, we did see on-site flower abundance increase over time. Um, which was expected. And to be quite honest, it would be sort of a problem if we didn't, because these were former ag fields. They were previously corn and soybean. Um, so they really had a very, they, they only had, well, had one way to go, basically. And the only, only way to go was up, really, right? Um, and so we did see um, some, some big changes in the, in the flowering community on site over time. Um, and these are some graphical representations of that change in the, 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 the on-site habitat, uh, with year zero, again, being 2018, all the way up to 2022 being year four, some, some significant increases in floral abundance and flowering plant species richness. Both had some pretty uh, strong uh, uh, increases. 
If this is what one of the sites looked like now in 2022, uh, again, this is all in Minnesota to kind of give you that geographic context. Uh, this is what a Minnesota uh, a prairie system might look like or a native native habitat system might look like. Uh, lots of black-eyed Susans, golden Alexanders, Pinstamon, uh, uh, common yarrow, et cetera. You could, you know, uh, you know a, lot of, a lot of variety in the plant community here. Um, looking at the, the critters now, the, the insects, um, again, like I said, over 650 transects, over 13,000 insects, the most abundant were the soldier beetles and surfid flies. So a lot of the smaller hover flies were very common, especially in year zero. If you look at year zero, um, surfid flies uh, made up pretty much all the observations. <laughs> a lot of observations were these small uh, surfid hover flies in year zero. Again, that's our baseline year. Uh, following that in years one and two, uh, things got a little bit more diverse, but abundance really wasn't that wasn't really there yet, right? It wasn't until year three and definitely year four when uh, we got diversity and we also got abundance. A lot more showed up, um, especially the beetles. I have a hypothesis uh, as to why we saw a lot more beetles in years three and four. Um, these these soldier beetles are uh, goldenrod soldier beetles. Um, and we didn't really see goldenrod start to bloom at these sites until year three. Um, and so there's probably a direct correlation uh, between goldenrod soldier beetles and goldenrod uh, that showed itself in our data beginning in about year three. Uh, pollinator abundance uh, and diversity also increased. So looking at just diversity metrics, uh, uh, the Shannon diversity index that also increased over time um, as we expected. Looking at total pollinator abundance and native bee abundance, both of those also increased pretty dramatically over time. Uh, one interesting thing that we saw in the, uh, to just looking at all pollinators, we saw these sites being used by monarch butterflies in all life stages. We saw uh, lots of larvae, lots of adults, and we also saw several um, chrysalis you know, um, um, at these sites. So it was very, very interesting to see that. Um, and then finally, looking offsite, we saw that you know the bee visitation to some of these offsite areas was uh, pretty high, higher than what we found in the in the interior in the roadside edges, um, but also pretty consistent with uh, bee visitation in the CRP adjacent areas. So this suggests to us that like CRP, solar pollinator habitat can help improve uh, agricultural services, uh, improve uh, bee visitation to some of these nearby ag sites. Um, so yeah. Okay, so that's some of our work in Inspire in Minnesota. Real quick, I just want to share some highlights of our work that we're doing in phase. Uh, our work in phase doesn't have a five-year uh, data set um, like we have in Inspire. We only have one year of data really to uh, to share. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to share some preliminary results from phase. For example, this one project where we're looking at um, a solar site that has pollinator habitat and only well, maybe about a mile away, there's another solar site that has turf grass. So it makes for a nice uh, uh, comparison between the two sites. Um, you know, do we see the same types of pollinators at uh, these two sites? Kind of thing. Um, so looking at that again within the phase project, um, you know, we spent the you know 2022 using the same kinds of methods that transect-based pollinator monitoring method. Uh, we looked at both of these two sites, and we we the 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 results are you know strikingly different. Um, we have seen a lot more pollinators at the site with pollinator habitat, as you might expect, um, and fewer uh, pollinators at the uh, uh, site with solar turf grass. Diversity also looking at these pie graphs. Diversity also looks to be a little bit higher at the at the site with the solar pollinator habitat. Just looking at the the numbers of different pie slices, if you will. We haven't calculated any standard diversity metrics yet, but just looking at these pie graphs, it looks like uh, we would see greater diversity measures at, at this site with, with solar pollinator habitat. So that's one example of one direction where uh, our phase research is going, kind of looking at uh, two different types of solar sites, one with turf grass and one with solar pollinator habitat. Uh, with the remaining time, I, I think I've got a few minutes. I want to share with you a little bit of our work, you know, looking at other types of biodiversity responses at solar sites. So using some of these passive recorders, acoustic recorders and cameras to record and detect wildlife activity at solar sites and also in adjacent offsite agricultural fields. 
um, with the idea that you know uh, these offsite ag fields represent the previous land use before solar. So kind of our, our control or reference locations. Um, so we set up these tripods in a number of different locations. Here's one that shows an on-site location on a solar site with the acoustic recorder and the camera. Here's a tripod location off-site, um, you know, in a nearby but off-site agricultural field using, um, you know, the, the same the same design. Um, and with that, um, so far in the last oh, a little bit over a year, we've collected over one terabyte of data from all of these recorders, and we anticipate that trend to continue throughout the life of, of, of these projects. So a lot of data, these are, um, are, are ways to collect a lot of data on wildlife activity at solar sites. Uh, over 5,000 hours of acoustic recordings, over 100,000 ultrasonic recordings. Um, not all of them may not be bats, but there are over 100,000 uh, ultrasonic recordings and over 80,000 images. Um, you can see uh, a couple examples of the, the wildlife um, in the cameras that, that we've detected. And this is sort of our acoustics workflow on how we process the avian acoustic data by taking all of the individual wave files that we collect, the, the audio files, running them through an algorithm on BirdNet. So Cornell University has a, an open source available algorithm that can identify and detect birds by their songs um, called BirdNet. So we run that through uh, all the recordings through BirdNet to produce these detection tables um, by uh, each file and each timestamp within each file that detect uh, birds, bird species, with some level of confidence. Um, and then we take those tables and, and run them through R for further processing for uh, QAQC to you know, confirm species detections, uh, summarize the data by location and site, et cetera. Um, and so this is one um, example audio file that we have obtained from one of the recordings. I, it's, it can play. I don't know if everybody has their sound on or if we are able to get this to play, but here's what one of the recordings sounds like. And that is an indigo bunting that we recorded at one of our sites. So this is just one example of thousands upon thousands of individual detections that we've made um, from our acoustic recorders, oops, um, and using that, we've been able to, at least at a very preliminary, pre very preliminarily, we've been able to um, analyze some of that acoustic data for just that, that first year, 2022, um, and looking at, at, at some of our, our sites. And, some of, and here's a graph that sort of summarizes one of those sites um, in terms of what we've detected and how much activity or the sheer number of detections that we've made at these sites. So looking at tripods that are set up in reference ag fields versus tripods that were set up on the solar site. Um, some of the interesting, th interesting things that we found is that we've got greater activity, more bird detections or, or just more detections in general um, offsite in the ag fields than we see on, on onsite. However, when we look at the identifying the individual species that are driving those detections, we see species richness is actually greater on-site than off-site, um, double at least, <laughs> more over two times more uh, species on-site than off-site. Um, and again, this is just from one, one solar site, so it remains to be seen on whether this pattern uh, is upheld across other sites or across multiple years. Um, but it's interesting to, to see that a lot, of, a lot of the activity in the off-site regions are, are driven by a lot of these very common species that like to call, they're very noisy, uh, geese, crows, um, et cetera. Um, and so, and, and killdeer, they're driving a lot of the detections offsite. Whereas onsite, we're still seeing a lot of the common species, but we're also seeing a lot of other neotropical migrants come through and, and are detected like the uh, indigo bunting that I just showed. Um, a lot of other species as well that aren't as present or prevalent uh, offsite. So just some interesting preliminary findings to share with you all. Um, but all that to say, you know, if you build it, will they come? That whole field of dreams analogy. Um, yeah, it sure looks like it, uh, at least for insects. Uh, you know, the research that we have ongoing is, is promising. It, it sure looks promising, at least for insects and maybe for, for other, other wildlife. Um, we've only started studying, uh, you know, biodiversity responses for just the past year or so. So um, that's still a little, a little early, but all, all things look good. Um, you know, however, you know, we need, we want to keep in mind that ecologically effective solar pollinator habitat 
just might not be feasible everywhere. It might work in the Midwest where we've got a lot of former ag land that's being converted to solar, but it might not work very well in areas where it takes a long time for restoration efforts, such as the desert Southwest, or in certain situations, you know, where you might be converting habitat that was previously quite valuable for uh, 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 ecologically value, valuable uh, into solar. So, um, you know, it's, it still remains to be seen the full, um, you know, potential for solar pollinator habitat, but um, it does look like um, it, it has uh, uh, some potential uh, ecological uh, benefits that we will continue to study for the next few years. And I think it's, what is it, 1230 Central? I will now hand things over to Heidi, who's going to walk us through some of our current work and planned work on other types of ecosystem services related to carbon storage. Um, Heidi, I am happy to move the slides if you just want to tell me when to go. Thank you. That's that'll be great. And um, just to note, I answered a couple of the questions in the chat and uh, just decided to wait and we'll try to get to all of them um, when I've just presented a few more slides, finishing up a discussion of our current work and our planned future work. So um, uh in, after the ecosystem services paper on theoretical soil car, uh, soil carbon potential uh, storage potential was published, uh, Lee mentioned that paper earlier in the presentation. Um, we realized that our partner solar sites um, for pollinator habitat research offered a great opportunity to obtain empirical data for soil carbon storage. And we discussed uh, obtaining some data with the solar uh, company partners, and they were all very interested in looking at soil carbon storage at their facilities. So um, we formulated a couple of research questions, just basic. Um, how does the total carbon and soil organic carbon change at solar facilities over time? And then how do the varying vegetation management strategies at solar facilities affect total or carbon and soil organic carbon? Um, so Lee, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so we started this a little bit slow because we it hadn't originally been part of our research plan. But we collected uh, initial soil samples at three of our Midwest or phase partner facilities in late 2021. And for that sampling collection, we used a soil coring method that we got information from at from University of Illinois Champaign researchers that are doing agricultural soil research. And um, then subsequently last November, we collected uh, data from two of the Minnesota solar facilities and we are planning to obtain soil samples at a partner solar facility in California, quite a different eco region. So we will um, you know, get some interesting geo, uh, regional differences from the, including that facility. Um, so at each facility, we um, select six random locations for uh, the on-site soil sampling, and where possible, we've paired that with off-site soil sampling to use those off-site areas as controls. Um, we also, in, for some of the sampling, co um, collected three subsamples at each location to sort of get a better representation. And then we pool those samples. Um, we're obtaining two depth increments from each location, zero to 10 centimeters and 10 to 30 centimeters. Um, so for the 2021 sampling, as I mentioned, we used soil corers and it's very labor intensive process, takes a lot of time, but you um, can calculate the bulk, bulk density from that methodology. Um, it, it, during 2022, we started to work a little bit with 
TSIP, that's the Soil Inventory Project um, group. And that group, um, it, it, they're investigating uh, agricultural, uh, the, the soil carbon levels in agricultural soils. And um, it's contributing to a, a database that they have online where they, you can, researchers can look at the some of the differences in agricultural management practices and that re the relationship to carbon stocks. So we were very happy to start working with them a little bit and also started using their soil sampling using a drill, which is a much easier uh, method and also enables a greater number of samples to be collected. Um, okay, next slide, Lee. So we, we don't have a lot of results yet. This is a relatively newer effort, but we did obtain some results for the samples we took at the Minnesota sites um, in the offsite locations. So on, in these two figures from the two different sites, uh, the black circles uh, represent soil sampling locations that we haven't gotten the results from yet. And the other ones, uh, a range is color coded. The purple ones have less than 2% total carbon in the soil. And uh, the orange ones, there's just a few on the left, that those are greater than 4%. The maximum in those samples was 8%. So we're looking forward to getting the results for the on site samples and see doing some comparison. Um, so for these sites, we'll be able to hopefully, you know, we, we'll have the on-site off-site comparisons for, and the off-site areas are generally agricultural fields, um, and on-site, there's been, um, this, this pollinator-friendly habitat planted for five years already, so um, that'll be a good comparison, but we also would like to compare over time and plan to collect soil samples from the same locations at various time increments to look at those changes over time. Um, so next slide, please. So um, back to the original presentation outline, I just wanna say a few words about where we're going with our work. We've uh, not been able to answer all the research questions. So um, there's a lot to do yet, but we um, primarily, one of our first goals is to publish the Minnesota pollinator results. Um, we may publish an interim version. We, we will continue monitoring at the Minnesota sites for another two summers, but um, we would, uh, you know, we may, may, put it out there now just because we already have a pretty good data set. Um, and then we um, would also like to do some more comparisons between uh, so, uh, pollinator habitat at solar facilities versus at other um, conservation locations where similar habitats exist. Um, we have some data of possibilities for looking, comparing solar turf grafts facilities with ones that have pollinator habitat planted. And then we also will be comparing to agricultural fields. Uh, we're expanding to look at more closely at the specific seed mixes and how they, the, they perform. Um, and then different man vegetation management practices. And, um, and we also would like to expand the solar soil health research. Next slide. And these are just a couple of pictures um, showing the on the left hand side, we've got a solar pollinator habitat, sort of a prairie vegetation. So on the right side, there's sheep grazing at solar facilities, which in that particular picture, um, you know, it shows that the sheep really do graze down the vegetation quite a bit, um, but with careful management, you rotate the sheep and actually there's some data showing really good um, results for the pollinator habitat, even with sheep grazing. Um, so it's an interesting vegetation management strategy, 
you know, instead of mowing, you can use sheep and also perhaps do a better job of fire control because you don't have such a um, long-term buildup of, of dry vegetative matter. So uh, lastly, this is just a couple more slides. I wanna talk about a new project that we are going to be starting very soon. Um, it's also CETO funded and it is now expanding the so, um, solar uh, soil research from just uh, carbon in storage in soils to look at some other constituents in soils. Um, we will be first off initiating a national science-based science data collection system uh, to inform about ecosystem service potential of soils. Uh, we'll start with recommending best practices for both field methods and lab methods for looking at carbon pesticides uh, two specific metals, cadmium and lead, and two specific nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, in solar facility soils. Well, the goal is to get consistency in methodology and data quality uh, across the solar industry and to aid uh, individual facilities so that, so that individual facilities uh, don't need to do one-off studies and you know, come up with their methodology every time. We'd like to aid them with looking at this as for the industry as a whole. Um, we would, from a research standpoint, it would be very helpful to be able to contribute all that data to a soil, uh, uh, national soil uh, for solar data repository and um, investigate the quantities and timelines for soil-based carbon storage. Um, so one, one more slide and then we'll get to, we have a lot of questions and answers. Um, I wanna mention that we have a lot of collaborators on this new soil study. There's interest from uh, soil researchers in academia, NGOs, regulators, and of course the solar industry. We also have, uh, Partners that uh, uh, one partner is MTERA, the Midwest Tribal um, Renewable or um, Energy Research Association, and um, so we hope to also be able to include research at some of the on some tribal lands and help promote um, ecosystem service research at those facilities. And um, we really. One important question we wanna look at is the um, length of soil carbon storage and how much you can store at in both at individual solar facilities and do some um, assessment of the potential for the industry as a whole as it's growing and more land is devoted to solar. So with that, I will uh, stop and I think that we're gonna go on to our question and answer session. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have a lot of, lot of great questions in here. I'll, I'll pose as many as I can to you in the, in the time we have <laughs> left. Um, first one was from Isabel. Uh, she wanted to know if you have issues with pesticide drift from nearby agricultural land. And I'd also like to know Drift Watch is a really good uh, program for that, but I'd like your thoughts on it too. Yeah, good question. Um, I personally have heard it mentioned as a as a consideration, uh, pesticide drift. Uh, but at the sites that we've been monitoring, we haven't, um, you know, directly tried to quantify pesticides uh, at the pollinator plantings or how they might influence the pollinator plantings. Um, but I know Heidi maybe can can mention this. Uh, pesticides is one aspect that we might try to cover in the soil study just to see how pesticide residues in the soil might change over time with the hypothesis being that if you take a piece of land out of agricultural production and put, a, put it into solar, that those soil pesticide concentrations would uh, go down over time. That doesn't directly answer your question, um, uh, Isabel, uh, but uh, it is sort of related to, to, to pesticides at these solar sites. Yeah, yeah and, and I would just add that we will, you know, plan to set up the sampling so that we can sort of look at the um, 
gradient of pesticide levels from the you know site perimeter in towards the center because the theoretically if there is drift happening you'd have higher levels closer to the edges mm -hmm. but um yeah it's, it's it's an interesting question okay, thank you there is several questions around panel height and maintenance um, mowing grazing things mm -hmm. like that I'm wondering if you could speak to the panel height at these projects, what type of maintenance you had to do, did you have to reseed and did you have to get rid of invasive weeds, and if you have any thoughts on costs, I know Pete Berthelsen's on the, on the call too and he could probably drop in the chat some thoughts on cost. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's a lot to discuss, and we could probably spend an entire webinar talking about all of that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just real quick, just off the top of my head, some of the things that I'm I'm thinking about. Yeah, panel height is um, a consideration um, and and uh, oftentimes a limitation for what can be planted at the solar sites, uh, because depending on the type of technology, if it's a tracker or uh, how high the panels are off the ground, typically, um, you know, developers that we work with ask for things to be less than three feet, preferably less than two feet. Um, and so if we can find plants that don't grow taller than three feet um, as a requirement, but preferably lower than two feet, um, that is that is ideal. And so, um, and, and that that is for uh, areas that are within the, the array. So between the panels and the outer perimeter of the solar sites, what we've seen is that, uh, you know, there might be different kinds of plantings in the outer perimeter of the solar sites because you don't have that, that that limitation anymore. Um, and so lower growing vegetation in the in the arrays, uh, consisting of different types of grasses or uh, lower growing wildflowers uh, like um, uh, 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 butterfly, milkweed, et cetera. Um, and, and also uh, the mowing. Um, I think I, I was very quickly looking at the, the chat. And so I think I saw a, a question about mowing. These sites are mowed um, at, at, with the idea being that early on, there's a little bit more frequent mowing going on. And then over time, as the habitat matures and establishes, let's say after three years, the frequency of mowing will then uh, decrease. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Heidi, was there anything you wanted to tack onto that? Um, you know, maybe just that we we do have a variety in, in our own study sites that we have in the Midwest. Um, the height of the panels varies, and there's a couple of sites where the panels may be lower to the ground, maybe only two feet, and it, you know, that really is then um, a consideration for what kind of uh, plant species can be can be seeded. Um, we one factor that I've heard that determines some of the uh, panel height is latitude. Um, locations farther north where they get more snow tend to put up, you know, ha have the panels higher off the ground, um, which then does help with establishing uh, a more diverse seed mix of um, plants on the site. That's right. Great. And so, you mentioned milkweed, Lee, um, and, and there was a question about monarchs. Um, can you can you speak to what you saw with uh, monarch butterflies? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Especially these last two years, we saw a lot of monarch butterflies at the two solar sites that I mentioned in, in Minnesota. Um, we were actually lucky actually pretty lucky to actually see a couple cases where uh they were emerging from the chrysalis um and some of the the transects so um especially the last two years they you know milkweed establishes pretty easily at some of these sites i, I don't want to say it's happening everywhere but uh we we see common milkweed swamp milkweed butterfly milkweed uh at all many i should say of these uh solar sites in minnesota um and as a result in addition to other uh, plant diversity, um, we've seen quite a bit of uh, monarch activity at these sites. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question in here asking about the difference between organic soil carbon and carbon. Um, yes, I'll, I'll take that. So um, soil organic carbon is mo more related to the um, vegetative matter that is um, it, it, 
at the surface or in the root systems contributing to sort of actively to the carbon content. The two are related and we are planning to measure both in our future soil analyses. Um, probably we'll focus more on soil organic carbon because that changes more rapidly based on vegetation management than the total organic carbon. Great, thank you. There's a question um, asking if there was a, a relationship between the size of the site and the results. And I believe that they mean if it was a larger site, was there a greater abundance? Yeah, and that's one of the things we're really trying to see if that, that relationship exists in the, the phase project. Uh, the Inspire sites that we've been working at in Minnesota, they're pretty equal in terms of their size, and their management style, like how the vegetation's managed, although one site does have a little bit more livestock grazing than the other, um, and what was planted. So they were planted with similar uh, uh, species, um, although the sites were a little bit different in terms of the soil composition. And so there were some specific plants planted at one site or the other, but the, in terms of the size, um, you know, they're, they're about the same. So I don't know if we'll be able to tease apart or, or make any relationships it, just within the Inspire data uh, that we have, but within the phase project, we do have some variation in terms of size and planting configuration that we hope to see if there are, are differences across um, those, those points that you raised. That's great. Are, are you going to look at the difference in soil carbon on a grazed site versus a mode site? That's the intent. Yeah. We right. intend to, in the new new study that we're starting, we want to include all kinds of vegetation management. Um, you know, we we uh, the study design we hope has the potential to include a lot of sites because sites that participate will be obtaining their own data based on the methodologies that are recommended. So since our research team won't be needing to go to every site that's participating that we're hoping allows us to get a large quantity of data from sites that are managed in different ways. Great. Great. It looks like there's a question in here about the process of growing native grasses and wildflowers. And I, I know there's there's quite a process. So did you want to speak to that? Um, I'm not sure I'm looking at the same question you are. Um, there's one about needing to reseed. Um, no, this is just just recent. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's the very last one. Yeah. Oh. Um, so how how the seed was established, right? They, yes. I think it, it can vary, right? I think um, you know, in some some of the work that we've been involved in, there's some broadcast spraying, and then in certain cases where we've got individual, where we're trying to evaluate individual test plots, there'll be hand hand seeding. Um, where we're trying to keep this certain types of seeds like within certain rows. Um, and so yeah, I think it I think it varies depending on um, you know the the goals, what kinds of seeds are are used, um, and the the preparation that was done for the site. Great. Did you plant any plugs or was it all seed? No, we didn't. As far as I know, we didn't plant any plugs, right, Heidi? There were no we didn't. And you know, just to clarify too, um there there are a few uh, test plots at each of these um, sites that were, you know, done by the Inspire research team, but the overall entire sites were planted by vegetation management companies um, that we have access to their data and the seed mixes they used. Um, and as Lee said, they for those larger areas, it was always either broadcast seeding or drill seeding, but no plugs used at these sites. Great. And there's another question. Did did you have to water these sites to get the plants established? Nope. Oh, they they were all rain irrigated, which is fortunate for sites in the Midwest that, relatively speaking, get more rainfall than other areas. Do you get a bigger or a quicker growth near the drip edge? Um, I, you know, there's some research out there that indicates the vegetation community is different near the drip edge versus more interior. And I think some of those papers do indicate that there's greater growth or taller, taller uh, plants along that drip edge. Yeah. There is one exception to watering the, uh, our 
California site. It's right. more arid and the vegetation is watered there periodically. It's a it's planted on a smaller scale. It's really just the research plots there, not the entire site that's planted. Right. Yeah. So our California partners at UC Davis, they're looking at this similarly to see how much water is needed. Um, I think they might be using plugs in some cases for, for some of the planting uh, to help uh, get some of the, the plants established. Um, so, yeah. Is the site at UC Davis or is it a nearby solar site? It's a nearby solar site near UC Davis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. And is there any work, look like there's a question, is there any of this work being done in the Southwest beyond the California? Outside of UC Davis, there could be, I'm not sure if they're affiliated anyway with Inspire, um, but I'm not aware of any. Um, we do see several reports of the pointing towards the difficulties of establishing native plants in those arid regions. Um, it would be great to see someone, you know, take that on and see how feasible it is. Great. Looks like there's a question about financial benefits about planting the native plants under the panels. So other other Inspire partners are have done some studies, and um, I can perhaps look for. I know one is is has been published. Um, the trade-offs I can just discuss in a general way of, um, you know, you may, uh, you'll have higher upfront costs probably for seeding than if you just planted um, turf grass, uh, but you ultimately over many years should have a lot lower mowing costs. Um, it may cost more if you do use a higher racking system to keep the panels up higher off the ground, which would be another upfront cost. Um, so I can't say overall where it, and how the balance ends, but there are seem like there should be some um, cost benefits from having pollinator habitat installed. And um, I look for, for a couple of references on that. There's a nice increase in social license to operate to with this, you know, mm -hmm. so that that's is a, that financial benefit. Yeah. Well, that is all the questions that we have. And I think we're at the top of the hour, unless if anyone, I'll give you one more minute to drop something in the chat if you have a final question. Um, and if not, I would like to thank you both. Uh, we will post this recording um, within a week, I would say. You can also email us with questions at agrosolarandcat.org. Looks like there's a question here from Haley. How difficult is it to find farmers interested in bringing their sheep to graze land under panels? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, we at Argonne have been fortunate in that <laughs> we haven't been in par a, a part of those discussions. I don't know if I should say fortunate or not, but um, in a lot of cases, those partnerships have been established, um, you know, it, by other means through the vegetation management company and a local farmer. Um, so in, in the cases that we've been involved in, there's there has been a nearby uh, sheep farmer, for example, that is, has shown interest. Uh, but I don't know how difficult it is or what that process is. There is an association called the, the American Solar Grazing Association that um, you know, tries to build that network and linking solar companies and livestock grazing at solar sites. So there are groups such as that that are trying to build those, those relationships. Great. Yeah, we work really closely with them. And uh, we have a map of grazers, too, and can help connect you. And there's also some really nice work that ASGA does on setting up solar grazing contracts. So I highly recommend that you look at ASGA. Okay, so it says there's one current study happening in South Texas of Caesar Kleberg Wildlife Research Institute with Texas Native Seeds. So I think that's just more Great. of an FYI that's from Katie. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys. Um, this was very informative and really interesting. Um, look forward to seeing you all at the Solar Farm Summit in Chicago next month. Sounds great. Thank you for having us. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.